On this episode of Pick Rich's Brain, my guest is multi-award winning songwriter, artist, producer, Reggie Ham. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. And we're talking about the business of songwriting, where it's going, and how it's all gonna be fine in the end. Drummer, percussionist, author, composer, songwriter, producer, professional speaker, actor, Rich Redmond has left his mark on thousands of songs, including over 21 number one hits, over 30 years of been there, done that, wisdom and knowledge in the Nashville music business. This is Pick Rich's Brain. What's up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. This is episode 10 of Pick Rich's Brain, and I've got a real treat for you today. My friend Reggie Ham. Good to be here, man. Tell you about Reggie Ham. He is an award winning artist, producer, singer, songwriter, and we're going to deconstruct his career, and he's going to provide some real value for you today, especially if you're interested in songwriting the business of songwriting, what do you do if you move to Nashville and you're pursuing this crazy thing and the future of this industry? So thanks for being here, brother. Man, it's good I, to be I here, I really Rich. do appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. So, um, you know, maybe let's, we'll do the typical thing. Maybe just tell us a little bit about your history. I know that you were in a family band. You started yeah. off playing drums. Yeah. Everybody starts off playing drums. They should. And then they go, I'm going to play a real instrument that's more <laughs> portable. Yeah. That's it. Right? It was all about the gear, man. I, I couldn't handle the gear anymore. And you're still playing drums a little bit, right? Well, you know, a little bit every once in a while. Uh, I I just, again, man, I just couldn't keep up with the gear. I've still got my old kit, my one I old kit. Drums. I know. You got it. You got, this is like, this would have been heaven for me 30 years ago. <laughs> this is, you know. um, I am like a unicorn because I am actually from Nashville. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was born at the Baptist Hospital. Okay. And I got all the. This is as far as I've gotten. You got right? the paperwork just and everything. Got, just gotten right here. <laughs> and my dad was born in Nashville. My grandfather was born in Nashville. My great grandfather. So wow. I'm like a, I'm like a fifth generation native. We're going back to like so, Civil War. Yeah. Oh, right. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a. You know, I've been here. We've been here a long time. Even if I weren't in the music business, I would probably live here. You like Nashville. So, well, yeah, it's home. Yeah, this yeah. is where all my family lives. You know, so uh, so I'm one of those rare people who was actually born here. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was also born into a musical family. So my dad was a, a great guitar player. When I was born, the week I was born, he was actually doing a record with Ray Stevens. Wow. So he was, you know, working down at Studio B. Wow. And uh, my mom was a songwriter. Uh, my grandmother used to sing at the at the uh, Opry on Gospel Night, on Friday nights wow. at Gospel Night. So, you know, long long history. I always tell people at, at any given family reunion, I am the least talented guy there. Oh, stop. So it's in your blood. I mean. Yeah, it, well, it definitely was in my head, you know. You, you're not like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, be an accountant. You were just, you were going to be a musician. Yeah, you, you got, there's three things you can be in our family. You can either be like a tradesman, like a bricklayer or something like that. You can be a preacher or you can be a musician. So I chose the one with the least amount of work. I thought, I thought, you know. Those bricklayers so, can do pretty. I know some bricklayers that do yeah, pretty well. My, grand, my <laughs> grandfather was a, a bricklayer. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's great. Yeah. And, and so it was in your blood. And then you went to college. Where did you go to college? You went Man, I went one year to a little junior college that's not even there anymore in Cleveland, Tennessee. It was part of our church organization. I was, I was, our family was a gospel traveling band we were sort of like the gospel partridge family right. so, and i played drums i right. was chris and who played who was the tracy that played tambourine uh we didn't have a tracy we we, we were tight man it was <laughs> okay. lean you had to play you had to really play something right, right. Uh, so my brother was the bass player i was the drummer my mom played piano my dad played guitar and we all sang from our instruments so, fantastic <clears throat> so i should sing lead and play drums so I, I i got really fascinated with like the don henley's and the in the uh um uh, Bill Collins, and, yeah. you know, LeVon Helm and people like that. Sure. The singing drummer. The singing drummer. Stan Lynch. I wish yeah. I, I wish I, you know, had that skill set. Like God gave me a bunch of skill sets to make other people sound good, but you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> like I do co writing sessions and they're like, sing that part. I'm like, I'll hum it to you. I will count it out rhythmically. But you yeah. don't it's just, you know, but it's it that is such a cool thing. And I tell my drum students, I say, you know what? If you want to make a living in this industry, pretend you're backing up a what is the lead singer gonna to want to hear from you? Don Henley never played drum fills when he was singing. Dude, I'm so glad you said that. Right? I mean, that you just kind of you sent me a hanging curveball because what I learned as a drummer and a singer was when not to play. Right. And a lot of drummers <clears throat> are great technicians, but uh, but they're not listening to the lyric. 
You know what I mean? And I, I sometimes even with world class drummers, sometimes you have to in a session go, "Hey, man, I want, this is what we're saying right here." You don't have to fill every I, four bars. I, I may not even need you. Sometimes right here. you just need to yeah. just <clears throat> coast, just spread the butter. Absolutely, you know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just spread the, <laughs> like Ringo, man. Just spread, yeah, that's you know? right. And, and and that is the one thing I am so I feel very fortunate to have you know because I was gonna after college. You know, I was playing jazz and fusion and odd time music. I was like, I'm gonna go to LA and I'm gonna play on soundtracks. I'm gonna be that guy. And my bags were packed for sunny Los Angeles. And I got the audition for Trisha Yearwood and Dina Carter and and Barbara Mandrell, all within a three week period. And I moved to Nashville, and Nashville taught me how to play a song. How to play the song. How That's to play it, a man. song. And That's now, it. and now that I'm spending more time in Los Angeles and I'm re uh, re exploring jazz and fusion and rock and roll music, it's that sensibility is still there. Yeah. And people look the lead singers, they'll look back and go, Okay, this he knows how to play a song. Yeah. Thank you, God. That's uh, it. That's, that's, that. Absolutely. That's a, that's such an, a valuable lesson is that you know, you're you're the foundation, you're the you know, you're the you're, you're the, you're the, the rock, mortar, man. you're the rock, you're the whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But 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 essentially you're also there to serve what's happening and what's happening in, is in the biggest picture. what I'm singing. Yeah. You know, in the biggest picture. So, yeah. and then uh, in the eighties, it t- started songwriting and the nineties, you had one of the biggest Christian rock hits. I surrender all. Yeah. So that was like, I just got to tell the listeners, this man has four over 400 cuts. Something like Wiki that. Wiki says, yeah. so, Wiki says Wiki, you have over 400 if cuts. If Wiki says it, it's gotta yeah. be true. I mean, that's a <laughs> lot of songwriting because yeah. not every song, is gonna get cut. Yeah, I've probably got four hundred more that are just set, they're you know, sitting in sitting a, there in a hard drive that you will never hear <laughs> that no one will ever hear. <laughs> well, you probably have some on uh, cassette, dat, CD. I do. So, did you yeah. do your due diligence and like try to transfer those things? I have. That, okay, I have that's like to the best of my ability. There, yeah. There's some stuff out there. I probably it just kind of vanished. You know, I don't yeah. know. I don't know where it is. It, my first deal. I got my first publishing deal when I was 18. That's amazing. So that was mm-hmm, years ago, you yeah, know. Yeah. So there's a, there are a lot of those songs that I, I probably couldn't tell you where they are. Yeah. But and maybe the, maybe some of them are unpitchable because they were written in the style of the time. Some some you know a lot of that is true. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just I just did a finished a, a second volume in a series that I do called Near Misses, which are songs that I wrote for other artists that they did not record. That is a great idea. That I think should have been recorded. So, so you're recording them. So I they're they're basically my demos. Okay. So what I do is I go in and, and do a setup, like a thirty second setup, just on on tape, and then it's like a radio interview, and then I, I you know, I fade into the song, just like you would hear. And this is on video or just audio? No, it's it's your CDs. So I sell them at my shows. Oh my so you God. can you can buy the songs that never saw the light of day. You know. So you say like I wrote this one for Garth, but he passed, and now it's... Garth is a great example because yeah. there is one on there yeah. that I wrote it with. Kyle Jacobs and Billy Montana, the guys who wrote more than a memory. Uh, I wrote wrote songs with those guys. You know, what I could say about the Nashville community, and and I love this, that idea, is that I wrote songs for five years for Magic Mustang Publishing, a drummer. I had a publishing deal for five years. It was crazy, and they were so supportive. But I reached out to so many people in the Nashville community and said, you know, they know me as a drummer. They've seen me play for 16 years. Like, now you're writing songs, but they're so welcoming. And they're like, you know, we love having a drummer on the session because we choose the right tempos. Absolutely. It already starts to feel like something, you know. And so, uh, and then surprisingly, I really love doing lyrics, you know. Well, this is the thing about that. And this is why you're, you're probably great at it. Drummers know where the, where the stuff, where the hammer's supposed to fall, Right. Cadence, the cadence, and crazy. Absolutely, and, yeah. it's all about the metrics, man. And there are a lot of great lyricists out there who have to really learn, you know, where the beats are supposed to happen and yeah. where the money line is supposed to, you know. It's like you're writing poetry; <clears throat> you are not writing lyrics. Lyrics yeah. need to fit into a melodic structure that's of, that centers around two and that's four. Exactly you right. Know, so, and just like the drummer supports the show, the the lyrics. I always believe the lyrics should be sort of subordinate to that melody like that melody is the sugar right and the lyrics are the medicine but the but you're not i don't feel like you're you're building melody to lyric i, I feel like you're building lyric to melody yes and, and that it should be the melody should be the thing that's just effortless and timeless and it was the thing that was always there and the lyric it was was married to it and that's you know? that's what the soccer mom is going to hum in her minivan is is, is, exactly is, the, right. is the melody yep so just to brag on my friend here, these are some of these awards here. Five-time CSAC Writer of the Year 
And then in 2008, you were American Idol contest winner. And what was the song you wrote? Uh, time this of is, my life. This is the time of, okay. Yeah. And and not to be confused with the Dirty Dancing song. Yeah, not the same one. So, yeah. what was your experience? Uh, as an artist and that television show and the contest mentality in Hollywood like anything you want to share with us about that you know <laughs> well the only thing I could tell you is it's it wasn't all it was cracked up to be mm -hmm. um, it was I, I, a, a, just a couple of times in my life I've gotten close to or experienced or been around m true mania not just success not just big shows not just hey we're making it but true absolute mania where, right. it, where it's like where you feel a little bit a little bit a fraction of maybe what the Beatles you know or somebody Stadium, like that or yeah. Elvis or something like that yeah. where it's true just cr like these people are insane like what's happened to them and that show that the, the, the year that I won was the biggest season that American Idol had it was the biggest finale show that they had it was you know it was at its apex amazing and it was 10 years ago <clears throat> it was 10 years ago but it was it was something I've I've been in the music business my whole life. Mm -hmm. That was something I've never seen, and and I was just kind of on the side. I was just as a songwriter, just looking. I can't imagine those kids who were on the show. Right. You know how they felt about it, and then the stars on the show yeah. who were in it every you know right. for years. But it was true mania, and I've still have I I got fans, you know, as as sort of a spillover from the David Cook fans, from the American Idol fans. I still to this day have fans that will follow me and contact me and come see me at shows and stuff That's like great. that that were just American Idol fans you know Amazing. and it, 10 years later yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but it was it was a true it was a true happening it's exciting you know? and it's a major feather in your cap and well it was it so was cool. it was kind of right place right time yeah. you know I, I don't feel like I can take a lot of credit for it I, I was just there and I showed up and did what I could do and you know that you're like dude you're you're like the example of this of just Taking every opportunity, it's making the most of it. You can, just yeah. you know, I mean, you to me, you're like the poster child for that. Of I'm on the milk. <laughs> I'm on, on the I am milk. on the milk. You're, you know, uh, and, and so there are so many, so many players. I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, so many it. players yeah. who've come to town. They play for major artists. We don't know who they are. We might never know who they are. You 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 took this opportunity and you have you're building like a brand. I love it. I mean, we oh, thank you. we talked about you on the road last year when I was oh, going good. down Troubadour. It's always we, good to be talked about. Yeah, we we talked about you. Man, Rich Redman knows what he's doing. He knows how to do that thing, you know, oh, where, cool. where that you have to do today to, to be relevant and all that. So God, getting relevant yeah. and staying relevant just just, just exhausting. Well, it's a full time. It's a two full time job. It is a full time know? job. But I am just so excited to have you here because if there's people the people that are watching from all walks of life, if you're a drummer. And you're not writing songs, you got to get in the game. And for those songwriters out there, this is a wellspring of information. So behind the camera, Jim McCarthy, he's my right-hand man. He's our producer. Yeah. He's our voiceover artist. He came up with that intro video. He is a polypotentialite. We're going to talk about that, a multi-potentialite. Um, but uh, do we have some questions for Reggie on yeah. the socials? Dennis Scott Kelly uh, times in and says, where do you see the trend going away from crooner or singing group? Away from crooner or... Do you see the trend going away from crooner or singing group? Uh, meaning... Um, Artist-wise, I guess. I'm not sure I understand so, the may, context. Yeah, maybe it's maybe he's, the question is, um, what is more important, the singer-songwriter that sings their own songs or a songwriter that gives um, their material to some, somebody that can do all the pyrotechnics? Yeah, right. Okay. You know, I'll that's my... Well, I would say in that, <clears throat> in that regard... One of the problems that the songwriters face right now is that the royalty situation hasn't caught up with the technology. So if you're just writing for other people, if that's what you want to do, if that's how you want to make a living, it's a, di it's a more difficult road right now than it ever has been because... With Spotify and Pandora. With, with Spotify and Pandora because the, the, the royalty structure just isn't there to support really a living. There was a day when it could. You know, I mean, you had to hustle. you got to be on... Two, three million records a year. You got to have a single, maybe every five years, whatever. But you could cobble that together and make a really good living out of it. If you had a string of hits, yeah, you could get rich. <clears throat> but you get on a roll. Yeah, um, you have a run of five, six hits in a row, and then you put that together. That's serious, and now you're talking about buying real estate. Right. Uh, right now, if, if you have five or six hits in a row that are like streaming hits you still can't really there's not a number you can put on it because we you know you're getting paid zero 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 point seven cents a stream of a penny 
per play, yeah. which may be fair in terms of it's one to one. You like it's one play for one person, whereas the radio is one spin for maybe ten million people. Right. But that doesn't really help the songwriter. Uh, where I am these days, Rich, is I do, you know, half a dozen. I'm, I'm kind of like you. I, I do all kinds of things. You right. know, I write a blog and I write books and I go do speaking engagements and I, I love it. Write songs and I, you know, songwriting You're is in a super group. I'm in a super group. I, I, songwriting is like you know, twenty percent of what That's I do. That's interesting to know. hear. Yeah. For so many years, it was. It was all I did. Hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. All in. And so you jibbed, you jabbed, uh, you know, Darwin, you know, basically you're, you're evolving. But what is the mechanics of songwriting? So I had this publishing deal. And for me, I already had a full-time job as a player and a speaker and a teacher. So I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. I'm exploring a new skill set and this is gravy money for me. It was very difficult because I always write in with three people. Right. Because I always try to write with somebody that has a great Pro Tools skill set, right. maybe that plays guitar, and a great singer. Right. And then I come in and I'm like the glue. So that means I had to write 36 songs a year yeah. around touring full time and recording full time and teaching. And so I was writing songs on Sunday nights. Sure, absolutely. You know, to get it all done. Um, so, so you're making money. Say you get a traditional publishing deal, you have a draw or a salary from the publisher. Right. And then you're hoping to get those songs cut by a major artist yeah. because an independent artist isn't going to pay the bills. That's right. So really... I'm an independent artist. You're an independent artist, right? <laughs> right. So, you, so you, that's a labor yeah. of love for you. <clears throat> that's right. You write what you want to write. Right. There's nobody that has your thumb on you saying write this right. way. So the, for the folks that want to chase the radio, you've got, say, how many greatest, uh, artists in, in, in top 40 country? You've got that. You've got to try to get your songs to well, those Well, forty artists. every week, and it never changes. It's, right. ne it's never forty-eight. It's never forty-nine. It's like it's like uh, old this old friend of mine, songwriter, threw the top forty sheet on a, on the table one day and said, "How many slots do you see there?" And I said, "Well, there's just 40. He goes, "There's never been more than that." Right. You know. So and, you, you only have that. And how difficult know. it is it to get your song heard? Through all the red tape, so you got to get through song pluggers, mm -hmm. publishing companies, to the artist, to the. There's a million ways to get that song heard. Yeah. There's no rules. It's the wild west. That's right. You can have a you can have a plugger. Yep. That you can maybe pay. Yeah. So so a plugger usually every publishing company will have a plugger, and that's kind of their job to do just that. Go out and plug. But you're also got to you've also got to plug. You got to be a fan of your own work. That's right, and you've also got to write strategically, mm -hmm. right? So if you can get with uh, Keith Urban, you should, you yeah. know. But even then, Keith's going to overwrite. So let's say you want to get on a Keith Urban record. Well, he's probably going to he's going to cut 10, 11 songs, or that's what's going to be on the record. He might cut twenty, but he might cut twenty five. He right. might he might cut all year. He might cut for two years. Right. And then that's when the the real competition is when they're listening and listening and listening. So it is a long process mm -hmm. to end up with a song that Keith Urban is singing on the radio. Yeah. And it's. A good friend of mine, a brilliant songwriter, award-winning songwriter, put it this way. He said, having a hit song is a little bit like jumping off the moon and landing on a postage stamp in somebody's backyard. Such it's a it's small just window. a small target, and you're starting from such a long way away. Right. It can be done. I mean, it, a lot of people do it, but yeah. it. So you're saying? Well, that. I feel yeah. I, it's almost like the Robin Williams joke about playing golf. He's like, "Yeah, there's this little flag so far away, and you hit it with a crooked stick, and, and it's so free." But people, they love it. I, yeah. Like my dad was an avid golfer. He probably plays three, four times a week in his retirement. He goes, "Do you ever want to try this with me, son?" I said, "I am Happy Gilmore, and I know that this is a very expensive, frustrating, time-consuming hobby. So I, I know, you know." Jim and I talk about self-awareness all the time. I know that I don't have the time to spend doing that. Yeah. I don't have a love life right now. I, I'm, you know, I'm totally overextending myself. But it's the same thing in Hollywood that I'm learning. I've been going to Hollywood for three years, and I am getting because I have agents. I'm getting in the room to do an audition. So you do an audition. The casting director says, "Like you." Next step. They call you for a callback. There might be two or three callbacks that you have to be available for, which is why everybody's right. a barista or a valet. That's right. Yeah. And then if you get the job, they, they, they get you to a fitting. Right. Then you might have a, a chemistry read. Then you shoot. Yeah. And I'm trying to do this all around a drumming career. Right. So for me, it's like, you know what? I'm going to do it anyways because somebody out there may just like me enough to put me in their film, independent film, commercial. Yeah. It must be present to win. Right. So if you want to write songs for country radio, 
you have to be in Nashville. You, right? you, you have, you have to, be. to be. I, I, I tell people this all the time, and, I, and I've had dozens of people say, "Can I do this from from Raleigh, North Carolina?" No. Can I do this? And I, and I, yeah, it's, it's a very short answer. A, no. no, you cannot. And and there are dozens of reasons why, but mainly is because it's, there's a movie called Being There. Oh, it, years that, ago we talk about oh, yes, and, right? And, and there's no write this down. Being, yeah, and I'm there right. there are no two. More uh, two important words. Was that, was that a documentary? No, it was a, it's an old film from back in the seventies, and it's 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 kind of a weird film. It's it's really interesting. But the point is, the guy who ends up sort of being the hero uh, may not necessarily have needed to be, but he was the guy there. He was there, being there. You have to be and, present to win. Yeah, and I tell people all the time, what are some of the three P's? Your personality, your people skills, and your presence. presence. Just being there right. and just being politely the, persistent. The greatest ability of all is availability. Yeah, you know. And, and what does Woody Allen say? He says, "99 percent of life is showing up." And then I add the smile on your face. Yeah, well, you that's know, right. I mean, ready to work. Yeah, you got to, and then especially in Nashville because it's such a community. Oh my God! You you can't come in and burn bridge after bridge after bridge after bridge and expect that to, to yield any results. I think one... Nashville won't work that way. You might way. get one burnt bridge ticket Yeah. in Nashville. Yeah. It's too small. Yeah. You just have to have a squeaky clean everything and a deep skill set. If you're going to burn bridges in this town, you'd better be Bruce Springsteen or Hank Williams because that's the only... You, have, you, better, you better have so much unbelievable, undeniable talent that the money you represent is worth more than the pain in the butt that you're going to be. Did you get that, everyone? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and and there aren't there are hard there aren't hardly any there's not hardly anybody like that. That talented. That talented. That talented. You know. Yeah. And it's the same way. Where I think like a lot of how has the music industry gone from signing bands to just a front person? Well, the the suits and the labels don't want to deal with six personalities. They do not. They want one That's person exactly that they right. can kind of. Let me tell you that when I was in bands, they used to say that to me. Yeah. Don't bring six people into this room. I've I've heard label guys say that. Do not do, do not that. bring six people in yeah. this room. I want to deal with one person. And I was in a band with six people. It was like <laughs> two people, many. Two, two yeah. people, too many. Yeah, that's right. And and but uh, so this is just so interesting to hear. So and you've been in some documentaries. You've been the sub. Yeah, you know, I'm, you, I'm in. I'm in a couple right now. What was the one that was ongoing. just out, Jim? That we were talking about that was at the Bell Court. It was about songwriting. Songwriting. Yeah. What was it called? Well, there was the last songwriter. I actually wasn't the in that one. Right. Yeah, but, but I'm in one called Ghost, Ghost Town Troubadour. Talk, talk about this. Talk about this. Well, we it was, so it's me and Travis Howard and Aaron Benward and uh, Danny Myrick. Okay, that's and a super group. That and we we started getting together and doing these shows, and it was just electric. And everybody's a great singer. Everybody's a great player. All the songs are great. You know, it, it's like wow. It's there's just no weak links and. Um, you guys need a drummer? <laughs> we, we might, dude. We might. <laughs> we're, only, we're only doing 40 shows this year. I'm, I'm around. Yeah. But um, what we we decided when all this stuff started happening with the songwriting rights and, you know, the songwriters are kind of dropping like flies. And so we thought, man, we, we started talking about ourselves as maybe let's, we should, this should be a show. This should be a TV show. And then we decided it was a little more serious than that. And so we got in a van last summer. In Nashville, we played the listening room. We made seven hundred dollars, and we took that seven hundred dollars and drove to Destin, and we made enough in Destin to drive to Lafayette, Louisiana, and we made enough in Lafayette, Louisiana to drive to Houston, and enough in Houston to drive to Plainview, and enough in Plainview. Did you go to Troubadour? And we went all the way across the coast, yeah. and we basically gigged our way, and we were literally paying for gas with merch money That's that we really made that cool. night. That's really cool. And, and the, keeping it real. Then we did a whole California run the same way. We, we, we played Vegas. We had an anchor date in Vegas, and we played that night, and the guy shooting the documentary said, um, guys, I can get you a show in Fresno, but we got to leave at 6 o'clock in the morning. And so we did. We packed up, you know, drove up to Fresno, did a show. So anyway, it was that, and we ended up, the, we finished this, the tour at the YouTube headquarters in Los Angeles. First live music event that's ever been done, oh. that was ever done there, and we did it. That's nice. And, and when then, was this? This was last summer, uh, okay. 16. Summer I think I remember six. running into Aaron at the Red Door, of all places, because yeah. now I live 200 feet from the Red Door, which is very dangerous. And he was like, he's <laughs> like, man, this is we're having said, it's going to be a reality television show. I was like, wow. Yeah, and oh. so it's it's either going to be a doc or, you know, or a web series. I, I we, We're still not exactly sure what it is, but mm -hmm. we've... Then since gone and play shows in New York and DC and kind of all over, so we've got footage from everywhere. We've Could got, be a Netflix. Yeah, well, that's we the, when we played New York, we had some some TV people there, and like this is a Netflix series, and the personalities are also different, 
and we've got kind of the four pillars covered. You know, we've got the trickster, we've got the serious guy, we've got the the. the I'm kind of the contemplative, you know. Who's serious? You know, Aaron is kind of the guy. He's okay. sort of we call him Captain America. He's the guy that's kind of out doing it and getting it. You know, uh, <clears throat> Travis is the jokester and okay. the, the you know. And, sorry, what? Are you Iron Man? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm 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 uh, I'm the sloth. My my superpower is I move really really slow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, any other interesting questions pop up, uh, Jim? Yeah, there was uh, one here. Um, it was a really good one. Jim McCarthy behind the camera here, folks. Behind the camera. Jim McCarthy voiceovers dot com. Jim was my he's great at that. He's great. From out with the business moving from albums. This is from Brad, Brad Ralston. Hope I'm saying that right. Yep. With the business moving from albums to singles, does that change the thought process? Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Great question. And yes, it does. And there's there's good and bad to this. Uh, the good news is. Everybody's always writing for the single. Everybody's swinging for the fence, and so you're tr you, you, there's almost no reason to, to get the cut if you don't have the single. Right. So, so that's the good side is that the competition it's 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 up Fierce. in everybody's game. For me as a pure songwriter, the downside is you don't get the cool B sides anymore. Yeah. You don't get that song that wasn't a single, but man, it moved me. What a great song! Nobody takes the time to write those anymore because there's no financial point in it. There's no business point in it. I still write them because I need to do it for my soul. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think other writers do too, but we don't hear those anymore. But if you can get you know a B-side on, say, a Jason Aldean record, you're still going to do pretty good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the business of it, you know, it, it's got us all focused on the singles. But, yeah. but there was, you know, we, we all have those great records that we remember growing up that, man, I, that third song was not a you know like it should have been should have, well look like i'll give you a great example to me the, the quintessential example to me one of the best songs billy joel ever wrote was good night saigon mm. never on the radio right. but my god i'm glad that song was written right and today i don't know that it would get i would had be, it on cassette you know? i had it on from the uh, columbia yeah. records and tape club absolutely man yeah. and, and so that's a great example of you know song that wasn't a single but really impactful glad it was written Wish we had more of those kinds of songs. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, funny thing is you mentioned about Billy Joel. <clears throat> you said you write the lyrics first and then apply the melody. I believe he does just the opposite. No, I said the the lyrics are supposed to be subordinate to the melody. I do I do it the way he talks about, mm -hmm. where you write the melody first and you marry those lyrics to the yes. to that melody. Yeah. So you have to fit syllables to right. to That's notes. It. That's right. You know, which is interesting That's because right. like I was just doing a co-write last night to midnight. Um, there's a a, a great new singer songwriter artist guitar player in town named mike crumpus and he's a great producer and every artist that he has in this is the power of relationships he goes come in and write with this new artist i got in from atlanta or from los angeles i'm like yeah because i'll probably play drums he'll hire me he's a great drummer but he likes to be upstairs and i go downstairs and i'll play drums and he's like stick around we're gonna write some more songs with these guys I'm like, this is great you know so people championing each other is a really big thing um what was that other documentary did you see that one the last songwriter i haven't seen it yet okay so i need to see it too <clears throat> and then i'm in the middle of a, of a documentary essentially about me uh and my journey i have a daughter with a severe disability talk, talk, do you want to talk about that? sure yeah you uh, have a foundation yeah so uh when i was an artist on universal i i i have a a really interesting arc i left christian music went and spent 70 grand of my own money making my own record is this was the Universal South single before American Idol or after? Yeah, so it was before. Okay, gotcha. So I had this this deal with with Universal South, Universal New York. It was I was kind of a co venture. They were going to try to break a pop act out of Nashville, mm -hmm. and I was the guy. And so um, had the single that was climbing the charts. Everything was looking up, and my my record dropped on March eighteenth, two thousand three. Mm -hmm. This is how old I am. Three days later, my wife and I were on a plane to China to adopt our first child. That's great. A week later, they handed us a little girl with one of the rarest genetic disorders on the planet. And they didn't know it, we didn't know it, you know. And so we got home and she had all these crazy symptoms that we thought would just even out, you know, once we got her back into the routine and, and all of that. And they didn't, they actually got worse and they got more dramatic. And, wow. and so um, we went through this five year odyssey and, and, and not only did that happen, but when I got home, my single died. And so all my tour dates canceled, and you know it was just a this really crazy spiral of trouble. And I had man, I had been batting a thousand up until then. I thought I could do no wrong, and then all of a sudden, 
things started being pulled out from under me. And did a three did three year stint with Mark Bright's publishing company, and nothing happened. The first time in my my entire life, I went three years without getting a song cut. Just couldn't write the right thing. It was missing everything by an inch, and. That's when, when I got out of that deal, I didn't know what I was going to do. And that's when I wrote the song for American Idol. And it became this huge hit, sold millions of copies. So a little bit of trouble and turmoil in your life led to <clears throat> greener pastures. Yeah, well, a lot of trouble <laughs> led to this really deep experience. And, yeah. and my daughter has something called Angelman Syndrome. So she's missing a piece of her 15th maternal chromosome. So she is nonverbal. She, she can walk a lot of... People with her condition cannot walk. She can walk. She okay. goes to school, um, but she she's, she no, she can't sign. She's she's probably uh, it, the, the, uh, people in the community don't like it when we make this comparison. But I, it's the easiest thing for people to remember. She probably expresses like about a two or three year old, okay. and that's she takes everything in age appropriate, but her brain won't express it back. Oh, wow. So um, very difficult to to manage and care give for that situation but she's also one of the greatest people I've ever known she's just right. loving and she just loves everybody and she wants everybody to be friends if she was in this room she'd make sure that you we're and I are hugging we're absolutely and Jim you got to come over here and hug too. so she's she's gets people together she's just got su such great qualities Beautiful. Um, but the song I wrote time of my life was really about her and my newly adopted son and when we were in Beijing and we were about to adopt we got little hats that said 2008 Beijing Olympic Games and we were going to bring her back for the games in 08. And, you know, I had a lot of money. I was going to be a rock star. I had, you know, all that all that stuff going on. Why couldn't I go back to China? Well, of course, we get back and the rug got pulled out from under us. And I lost my record deal and, and all that. But the song that I wrote for American Idol on the eighth day of the eighth month of the eighth year of the new millennium closed the opening ceremonies of the Beijing this Olympic is, Games. This is big. This is big. <laughs> And it did it, and they they used it seven more times. They used it every time Michael Phelps won a gold medal. So they used wow. it seven more times. Okay, where was I? I must have. So Oprah Winfrey declared it the official theme song of the 2008 Beijing. You're Oprah approved. So You're golden. I mean, that's written on stone somewhere, right? Yeah. So that turned into a blog that went viral, and that was the mania. I, I had millions of people repost the blog and 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 is this tell the story. Still writing this blog, and that kind of launched me into blogging. Nice. And that that became a book. And so they're trying to make a movie out of it. Now tell us about the book. Where can we find that? Uh, the book is Angels and Idols. Okay. And I think you can still get it on Amazon. All right. Um, and it's, it chronicles the journey and sort of the backstory. And I great give a lot, of, a lot of information about American Idol in, the, in my experience. Great title, it. Angels and Idols. It's great. And so they've been trying to make it. It was optioned to become a feature film six months after it came out. So we're, that's still in process. They can't find anybody in Hollywood good looking enough. To play me, I, that's the problem they're having. Well, I'll, hey, I'll, I'll play doorman number three. <laughs> but uh, so I'm working with Howie Klausner right now, who's a great filmmaker here in town, and he's sort of doing the documentary version. Yes. And it's what it's led me to is uh, with the life with my daughter has led me into so many other areas of music, and now I work with Bob Regan has a great organization called Operation Song, and we write with veterans who veterans. have PTSD. Yeah. And what I found is a lot of people who are caregivers for people with special needs have a form of PTSD. And that led me into really uh, exploring that and researching that and love the thing that's Bob, that Bob's doing. And it's really been helpful for me to help other people with yeah. songwriting. And I, that's really <clears throat> the thing I, I'm the most passionate about now about songwriting is how, how can I give back? How can I help somebody with this little skill that I have yeah. that I've developed over the years and so oh, 10,000 tens of thousands of hours of, of development that's right way more than yeah I, I know the 10,000 hour rule I'm like dude I, I've, I've put I tell everybody way that. more than 10,000 I, I put 10,000 <laughs> hours in my dark bedroom yeah by myself before I even played music with yeah I, absolutely you know that's right. so you're helping so soldiers come back with PSD yeah and they can express themselves through songwriting yeah and then you guys get recorded and yeah i'm doing a thing for uh larry sheridan and, and his bride uh robin ruddy they do make a wish yeah so on the 27th of this month there's a there's a family that uh there's a little girl she's not going to survive and so the family wants to memorialize her oh wow with a song. oh so wow that's gonna, amazing we're gonna do a make a wish thing that's tough man yeah. because you know what that ending you know that's that, that make a wish is a it's a good that's, thing. That's a really good thing. And you're speaking to now about yeah. So the book, when the book came out, I, w I had a lot of calls to come and and 
tell my story. Right. I, I bring my piano with me and I sing the songs and I tell the story. So, so if for a lot of corporate events, it's a really nice change of pace. You know, you have your instrument. I've got an instrument, and I can't tell you the hundreds. And I'm, it's literally hundreds of people that have come up and said. We've been listening to people speak all week, and this is really nice, you know, yes. to break it up with some music. <laughs> Thank music God, is such there's a no PowerPoint. Soothing, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's good. Yeah, really they good. don't want to take notes anymore, and you know, I just kind of let it. It's like relax and listen to this story, yeah. and, and here's what I hope you get out of it, you right. know, kind of a thing. And so, which is great with your instrument because yeah. you know I've been speaking for a decade, and 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 it, that's the the initial shock is oh, drums. Yeah, you, you need drums. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I need drums, but I said you're gonna love this, and this one lady comes up and she goes. I loved your message. Can you do PowerPoint so I can take notes? I was like, no PowerPoint. <laughs> no PowerPoint. No. So Jim, poly, yeah. poly potentialite. Yeah. Yes. But he's already realized all his potential. So what, tell, tell us. Man, I'm just getting started. Tell us about, that's, that's what I feel like life I'm, starts I'm, at 40. Dude, I'm 50 years old. Yep. I feel more creative, more positive more like yes. like the world is mine now than I ever I, have in my life. Between 40 and 60 is a man's prime everything. Not sexually. I was going to say. But, uh, uh, Rich, but, I, but, uh, but, but, but I like, as far as like a creative, like I'm in a creative renaissance right now yeah, where I'm expressing yeah. myself through music, uh, through drumming and songwriting and education and motivation. Yeah. And, and now I'm, Sounds now like I'm acting. Now yeah. I'm in the now I'm yeah. in the theatrical arts and I'm getting my improv training in Los Angeles next month at a school nice. that Tina Fey started. Nice, so it's just dude. I'm in it and it just feels so good. Yeah. You know, and I over I overextend myself quite a bit. Yeah. But I'm just it's okay. It, I'm in it. Yeah. You know, and we only get one life. Dude, you know, unless yeah. I'm coming back as Shirley McLean, I don't know. Well, we, you, you we might get this once. I mean <laughs> if I come back, I want to come back as I don't know, Hugh Jackman. I want to come back as my dog. My dog is so spoiled and gets every. You know what I mean. I but want to come back as my dog. Dogs eat, sleep, crap. That's all they do. I love it. <laughs> if you could have the gift of flight or a tail. <laughs> Jim does great impersonations. <laughs> I believe this, man. I believe everybody can do everything. I, I used to believe in specialists, and and I do think that we all have certain knacks for things. But I think. That it, it comes down to focus, it comes down to desire, it comes down to unlocking the potential. I, I, I see, when I work with the veterans, I see these guys who've put their life on the line, and a lot of people think, well, you know, they had to go in the military. No, I mean, there's some extraordinary people, uh, men and women, who have, have you know, dedicated themselves to taking care of us yes. and making sure we're okay. We, we don't think about that every day, and but I, they're out and there. And they're out there. And, and what you find is these are extraordinary people, and they can do this. And I've been in writing sessions with these with these people and gone, dude, that's a great line. That is a great line. You know what I mean? That's, a, yeah. that's wonderful. And, and you can do it. And I mean, I, you may not be able to become rich at it. I don't know. I mean, that's... Or rich at it. Or, you know or people I mean? are like, hey, I'm, so, so you're telling me I'm good at this, so I can... Can I do this? And, and then you say, well, you are you have potential to do this, but do you want to uproot your whole family, move to Nashville, right. and do really do this? Right. And Jim and I talk about that all the time, yeah. like having a knack for something and actually taking that leap the to commitment. actually do it. Yeah. Execution. Execution. Is I mean, it. I, we That's were talking earlier before before the camera started rolling about, uh, I've been binge watching Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars. Got to do it. Got to do it. And that's a great example of, and he, he talks about it often in and out of his uh, his little banter, in that a lot of people are funny, naturally funny. There's a lot of funny people out there. Oh. But it's a whole different thing to say, I'm going to L.A. or I'm going to New York, and I'm going to go do three sets a night, four sets a night, and I'm going to hone the material so detailed that any crowd that walks in here, I can make them laugh. Yes. No matter how old they are, no matter where they come from, what social, skill social what, that is what, and that is the difference between being. Oh, he's a funny guy, and he's a professional comedian. He is a comedian. He's a comedian. And do yeah. you want to? He said, "Do you want to get in your car, drive yourself around to these dumpy comedy clubs? That's it. Go backstage, get the flat meat with the right. mustard, and yeah. look at these sandwiches, and go. This is my catering, and I'm staying at the Rat Trap Hotel, and do that for years. That's the job. That's the job. That's the job. That's the job. And I tell young singer songwriters all the time. Look, if you're playing for 10 people or you're playing for 10,000 people, it's the same job. Mm. So if you see 10 faces out there, you've got to do the same job. Just slay it. And, and, and if there's 10,000 people out there, 
it's the same job. Yep. <laughs> it's not like the job changes. All that happens is you get better catering, you get you know better hotels, <laughs> more money. You know, you have a runner. I said, you know you, what? I feel right. like a nice coffee. Can you yeah, grab me a nice exactly. coffee? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jim, anything else, bro? Yes, uh, Karen Bushy Lucier. Oh, uh, we know Karen. Karen okay. is a big, awesome supporter in New England of my educational events. Right on. So we love right Karen. All right, Karen. Yeah. She says, uh, do you think songs that get left behind on albums could that could have been singles, do you think uh, they could somehow see the light of day again? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's absolutely possible. Uh, I know for a fact, because I know Marcus Hummond, I know that God Bless the Broken Road was cut, I don't know, six times really? before the Rascal Flats did it. It was 12 years old before the wow. Flats cut it. So Big there, one. There are, yeah, and it was their sort of breakthrough, breakthrough song, but it wasn't for anybody else. Mm-hmm. But it was just cut and cut and cut. And a good friend of mine, um, Melody, uh, her name's Kirkpatrick now, it was Melody Critton. She had a record deal with, I think, RCA, I believe, and she did it as her single, mm-hmm. and it wasn't a breakout single for her. And a couple of other people did it, but then the Rascal Flats did it. And a lot of it is the right version, the right time, timing, the right performance, all of that stuff really matters. So, yes, the, the short answer is yes, and it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. I know that me and the guys have a, a wish list of all of our, our favorite B-sides from the last, we're working on the 8th eighth, eighth, eighth Aldine record, which is unbelievable. Isn't that but crazy? The, that, that Michael Knox and Jason would champion the same players, the same engineers, the same studio. That's huge, dude. We go in, we yeah. do it, and, and we, but there's like, there's a couple of songs that I'm just like, wow, that would have been, Aldine feels the same way. But it's, right. a, it's that collective with the, the, the label. Yeah. They're gonna really choose the song. Absolutely, you know. Yeah, there are a lot of cooks in those kitchens, man. A lot of cooks. Yeah. So what's the uh, what's the uh, the future hold for you? Let, let's talk about this. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, Jim, but we can go over an hour if we wanted to. Um, somebody moves to Nashville. What is your advice to them to navigate this crazy music business? <laughs> If you want to just, if, it depends on what you want. I think you got to really narrow more than ever, really, what you want out of it. Uh, the, the the advice I give everybody, anybody who's under twenty five, you come to me and you're under twenty five, and you're like, man, I want to, I want to make it in the music business. I'm a singer songwriter, and I tell them this: you have in your pocket the greatest tool that we've seen mm-hmm. in the world in the last, you know, two three hundred years. Right. Take this and your instrument, get in your car, and start gigging, and start doing Facebook Lives, and start periscoping it, and start just every night, go find a gig. Right. If it's at, if it's outside of Wendy's. It's like the comedian doing three sets a Absolutely. Night. Yeah. You go find a gig, and I don't mean, oh, uh, we couldn't get one on Wednesday night. If you can't, go to a street corner and, make, and get arrested. Go play. Go busk. Absolutely. And you do it, and you do it all the way across the country. You start wherever you are, and you get to the Santa Monica Pier. And you start putting this out every night, and you get followers, and you tweet it, and you Instagram it, and you do you know, all the social media it. And by the time you get to L.A., you're either going to be great and have a following, yeah. or you're going you're gonna to be broke, and you're going to go, I don't want to do this. Because that's the job. Right. If, you, if you make it, that's going to be the job. Right. You're going to have to get in a van or some vehicle and do that. Are you yeah. challenging somebody to do that? I, yeah. I, I, I challenge them all the time. What a cool idea. I challenge them all. That's basically what we did with the Ghost Town Troubadours. We just happened to know people who would book us. Right. Mm-hmm. Plus, you, yeah, but, you, have that, you have that advantage, but from starting from scratch. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a Jewel thing. I think that's yeah. what Jewel did. She had a yeah. van. She did absolutely and, and, did and that. She, and she did that thing. Now, some people I met were, Cheryl Crow when she was doing that. And, and then and then to have her actually go on and then she sang backgrounds for Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson that's right. She was in a signed band called Toy something to a toy addict addicts toy. Oh, addict. I didn't know she that. She was yeah, she started, yeah. she was in a, a really a, and then she was writing every Tuesday night. Yeah, that the became Tuesday night the music tu- club. The Tuesday yeah. night music club and that was her breakout record. Right. And um it, it's so refreshing to go back and listen to that record because there's no tuning. Right. It's complete And they're all drunk. <laughs> They're drunk and out of tune and just enjoying life, and yeah. it's just so real and visceral. Yeah, and it worked. Absolutely, Isn't that what music's supposed to be. It is. Yeah. It is. But now it's it sounds wrong. Even if you have a great technician of a singer, it sounds wrong if you don't tune them because it doesn't sound. That's where we are for radio. That's right. That's so, where we are. That's know, right. But we talked about that with Curtin Tully about how some of the classics, you know, uh, Bob Dylan. Wasn't exactly the best singer. I but, think it was but, different expectations. But would for the Bob time. Dylan work today? I don't know. You know, I mean, he certainly wouldn't win any kind, any of the Voice or American Idol contests because those are pyrotechnic competitions. That's right. 
But I mean, your style of songwriting is very human, stuff, tells a story, to kind of throw back to the 60s and 70s. You listen to old Kenny Rogers stuff, it's always a story. Right. It tells a story yeah. in a song. Harry Chapin, the same thing. You know, people, you know, Kenny Rogers, that, that's a great example. Go back and listen to Ruby. A lot of people don't know what that song's about. This song's about a Vietnam vet who's lost his legs. Mm. <laughs> Go back and listen to Ruby. It is, it's, it's, it's like when you listen to it now, as, a, as I listen to it as an adult, I'm like, man, that was dark. You know? Yeah. But it was, man, it was like a real, you know. Country kinda, music was all, you know, painful music. Absolutely. And Don McLean's American Pie would never make it on the radio. Well, dude, There's eight minutes long. Verses, I mean, yeah, you know, how, do, how do you do that? Yeah. To button up your question. If you don't want to be a touring singer-songwriter, if you want to be in the business side of it, if you want to be a songwriter who works in rooms and, and, and writes for other people, it's kind of the same thing. I, I, I tell everybody this, and I, this is what I did. Come to Nashville, be in a club every night. Go to the Bluebird, go to Douglas Corner, go to the Listening Room, anywhere that there are rounds. You need to be and be in the, and meet the people that are meet booking the people the that are booking the rounds. Meet the people who are on the rounds. Right. Meet the people who are going to see the people on the rounds. Now, for people that are in, not in the know, what is a songwriter? Yeah, round? so a songwriter round is four songwriters, two here, two here, and it's in it. And it's basically a song. They call it either a guitar pool, songwriting circle, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But it's you know, A sings his song, B sings his song, C sings her song, D sings his or her song. And you go around four, five, six times, and it is, it's it's not really competition, but it's friendly competition. And you know, what it does for you is you're going to hear 20 songs that night. Four or five of them are going to be yours, and you know immediately if the guy to my right just killed this room. Yep. Now what do I sing? Mm -hmm. My very first 9:30 show at the Bluebird. For for people who know, the Bluebird is like. You know, for songwriters, that's Carnegie Hall, uh, and yeah. when you get a nine thirty show, that means that's it. A nine thirty Saturday night show, you've made it. That's that's the show. Those are always packed. No, and nobody gets that show unless they've got, you know, unless they've got the stuff. It, you don't Hits, just stories. yeah. That's right. You can get an open mic. That's how you usually start at the Bluebird, and then you're playing Tuesday night at six thirty or whatever. But if you're nine thirty Saturday night, you've got. You know, you've proven that you're going to hold the, the, the audience's attention and you're worth being there. My first Saturday night 9.30 show, Charlie Black is to my right. right. So for those who don't know Charlie Black, it's like, you know, hit song, hit song, and then Charlie Black goes, okay, well, this is a song I wrote for Ann Murray, and then he does a little good news today. Right. And then now I have to sing, yeah. you know, and it's like, they're already iconic you just songs. heard, yeah, they're not just hits. These are like... You know, then he does come next Monday, and then he does, you know, and it's like that was my first Saturday night, and it was absolutely terrifying. But did, I'm sure you, know? you did a great job. Well, I mean, I, I tried to, you know, I don't know how it went. I, I know that there was enough, uh, you know, enough going on that was good that everybody loved it, but that's, you get better that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I left that show going, oh man, I got, I got work to do. You know, I got to, I got to up, I got to up this. And, um, those are important, and you need to book those, and you need to do those, and you need to do good ones, and you need to do bad ones, and you need to do, you know. But you need to be out there meeting people. Yeah. It's and you Go get a job waiting tables. I mean, a lot of people I met, I waited tables for four years. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people, I waited tables, too. Yeah, a lot of people I met in the music business, I met waiting tables. Yeah. And so do something like that. Do something that's interactive, I guess, is the point. You're where, meeting people. Where, where you're meeting people. Well, I would say yeah. nowadays, I, I was giving advice. I would say, like, you know, be a barista because you're going to meet. Yeah, that's a gonna great meet, thing. You're going to yeah. meet suits. You're going to meet hipsters. You're going to meet writers. Everybody gonna, drinks coffee. Every, yeah. Everybody lo loves coffee. And if you don't, there is something wrong with you. Anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I would say. It, yeah. it, there's no shortcut for work. I mean, you just yeah. got to do it and you've got to be in it. And then on Sunday, you know, if you want to write... Christian music or worship music or whatever, you need to be there. You need to be in a church, or, or you know. Tell, tell us about this. This, by the way, twenty-one years in Nashville, I have never gone to the Monday night at the Bluebird. They have a line that lines up outside, right? And yeah. And you audition to be on the open mic. Yeah. yeah don't you? Yeah. And that's you're going to audition for the open mic. That's for crazy. the open mic, yes. Yeah. That's so right. the quality has to be somewhat. It's not painful. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something, man. There, there are brands. The Troubadour in L.A. You know, the Comedy Store. There are certain brands in the United States that really are taken seriously and the bluebird is one of them yep. and so you know you're not going to go to the bluebird they're not going to let you go to the bluebird and see crappy songwriters mm -hmm. they're just not and so yeah monday night you go audition and you might get 
Uh, you might get a spot at the open mic if you got two or three good songs. But the deal is, <clears throat> you're not playing the Bluebird a late show for people for paying customers until every song in your set kills. And and you know, and I always tell people that that's the difference. I, mean, I asked someone the other day. I was doing a mentoring session with a songwriter. How many how many songs have you written? And uh, 30, I think, 30, 35, something like that. I said, okay, um, how many of them are great? And it was like an off-putting question, you know, and it was like, because that's what we're looking for. <clears throat> we're not looking for, man, I think that song's pretty good. Guess what? Pretty good is not good enough. Right. Right? We're looking for great songs. It's like if you were getting a drum gig, man, uh, can you lay it, how, how can you lay it down, Rich? Uh, I'm pretty good, man. No. Let's hear it. Let's <laughs> yeah. hear it. I think, well, on those four or five years that I wrote songs, I think I wrote maybe, I don't know, maybe 140 songs. That's a lot of songs. And maybe maybe 25 or, or right. I would pitch. Was it, yeah, top shelf. And you know. and there's a lot, of, in Nashville, there's a lot of really well-written songs. Like that's There's nothing wrong with that song. It's all well-written. It rhymes in the right places. The melody soars the way it's supposed to, and all that, but it doesn't. It doesn't have that specialness. The it factor. That's it, man. And yeah. that's what that's what we're looking for, right. right? That's all we're looking for. We're not looking for, you know. N- never will you hear Jason Aldean go, man. You know, I need about a C level song for this next. You know what I mean? That's not going to happen. He's getting. <laughs> my last guest was Michael Knox. He said yeah. that they get <clears throat> thirty thousand songs. Eight thousand songs. Now, if you're submitting a song to Michael Knox, he listens to everything. That's a lot of songs. Yeah. That's a lot of top shelf songs to <clears throat> sift through. And then he weeds it down to 200 and then 100 and then maybe 50 to get to Aldean. And, and Aldean listens to him in, in the dressing room in our pre, pre-show right. room. And he goes, what do you think of this, guys? What do you think of it? Then that gets it down to 15. Right. That's a process. 8,000 songs. Well, and you, so you know, out of that 8,000, even if, even if it's half of them, and it's probably half of them that are great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or maybe 2,000. Or maybe 2,000 of them are great. Yeah. Even if just a thousand of them are great, that's still a lot of great songs. That's, that's you know? incredible. And so, so that's why I say even writing the great song is almost not enough. It's like then you get then you got to then you got to hit Aldine between the eyes with something he wants to say or something. It's like, oh man, that's a new twist I haven't heard, or that's a thing, that's a tempo I'd like to do that I haven't. You know, whatever it is, and that's that's just nebulous. That's just whatever. That artist is wherever they're wanting to go, and you can't predict that, right. and you shouldn't. They they've got to do that. You know, they've got to they've yeah. got to go down that road and, and focus. You know, I'm so proud of <clears throat> guests before that were my buddies Kurt Allison and Tully Kennedy, who I've been playing with for 18 years in Aldean's band, and they've been writing songs for six years now with a focus, and now they're finally having success. They had some the number one for Dustin Lynch. They oh, had cool. they got a couple of cuts on Aldean's record. So I'm like, great, because they're they're writing. A song a day, two songs a day, yeah. four days a week, five yeah. days a week. Like, you know, you're you're going to get some results from having that kind of focus. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. There, the, the ten thousand hour rule is true. You got to do it. Uh, and when I was when I was hitting dingers <clears throat> every six months or whatever, I, I mean, I was so focused. I I, I probably almost I put my marriage in jeopardy, but I worked. In 1995, and I write about this in my book, I worked on every holiday. I was in the studio on Halloween. I was in the studio on Thanksgiving Day. I was in the studio on Christmas Eve. I was in the studio. I went to the office on Christmas Day. Wow. I was in the studio on New Year's Eve. And on New Year's Day, I bumped into my publisher at the... We were young. And we were just, you know, it was like we didn't want anything left to chance at all. And, And we knew... Nobody's going to be in the office on Christmas Day, but I will be. I mean, if you don't have that kind of commitment That's at, incredible. at one point in your life, yeah. I won't do that now. But uh, but there was a point in my life when I did have that kind of focus and I commitment. I love that. I see, I go eat my mom's <clears throat> pumpkin pie on, on Christmas. I got to do it. I see them twice a year now. so I got. Well, I ate pumpkin pie. Don't I get me that. wrong. I, I just But that. I just took it to the office. Yeah. I love that. I mean, you know, one of the guys we never talk about, Gary Vaynerchuk, <clears throat> he talks about that all the time. With uh, We never talk about him? We never talk about him. Okay. <laughs> Um, he talks about that, you know, in your 20s, you should, he teaches kids all the time about college and, look, I know you got to be practical and go to college, but if I were you, if it's not you, you don't really need it anymore, depending on what you want to do. I, 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 had a, I read a whole blog on it. I, mm. I don't, general advice, not just music business advice, but general advice I give to kids, and this is the advice I'm going to give to my son. Man, go to community college, get your 101s and 102s out of the way, and then on your 21st birthday, go get drunk with your friends. Kiss them all goodbye, and and go, yep. travel, mm-hmm. T- 
take your get as far west as your money will take you. And if it gets you to St. Louis, get a job in St. Louis until you get enough money to get to Kansas City. And then get enough money. And you get to get all the way to the Santa Monica Pier, walk to the edge of it, kiss the United States goodbye, get on a plane, and start flying around the world. And 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 just wherever you land with whatever money you've got, go go help people in Calcutta. Go, you know, go Traveling is a great I mean, educator. Dude, and and go see the world and see what, how the world works. And by the time you can get on a cargo ship back to New York Harbor, by the time you get back to New York at 26 or 27, you could go to any dinner party on the Upper West Side and be the most interesting person in the room. You've been everywhere. You've done everything. That's great you, and, and, and you can always go back to college, but I don't think, I don't think enough people value the, just the, the, the hands-in-the-dirt experiential thing about life. I love that. That, is, that there's nothing you can replace that with. You right. know what's interesting though? If I had done all that experiencing of life, I would have never gone back to college. So I'm glad I got it out of the well, way. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I just got it out of the way, man. Yeah. I, well, and there's and there's something to be said for that too. You know, I, I don't. Wow. That's our garage, oh, man. The garage. Yeah. Okay, good. This is a this is a, one of those uh, man cave studios here. Yeah, in, I love um, it. But um, so I don't know where we are with time. Did we take one more question? But though I do want to ask uh, what the future holds for you and how people can find you. Well, the future, uh, I think the future is books for me, Rich. Um, I, I wrote a Christmas book that came out this year called One Silent Night. It is what I call a novical, and so it's a novella. Okay. It's it's a fiction uh, novella about a piano player in wow. Nashville who sort of washed up. He's playing at a hotel downtown, and a strange turn of events. He's lost his faith in Christmas and everything, and uh, a strange turn of events with a certain family at that hotel right. sends him on a on a Christmas Eve odyssey through the city that ends up at like three in the morning on Christmas Day and there's such redemption in it and it's a really an interesting twist at the end. Through this odyssey, this guy plays and sings ten Christmas songs, which is basically me. Right. I'm his fingers in his voice and that those ten songs are my Christmas record. So the record kind of stands alone as a Christmas record. The book stands alone as a book, but the audio book is kind of an experience because when the songs come up, it's it's embedded in the audio. Oh, that's great. So, and I went in to and, and kind of kind of did a little scoring on certain sections nice. to add a little drama or whatever. With so it's a great ex, a great audio book experience, and I love that kind of thing. So um, I'm working on a Father's Day novel now, uh, and then I've got a Halloween thing I'm working on. Wow, that's, that's a that's about a songwriter. Nice. It's a, but it's a so good you're story. using your experiences in life as a springboard for these novel- novellas. Novellas yeah. have worked really good, well for uh, Stephen King. Yeah, well, absolutely. King. Yeah, no, you no know, kidding. Yeah. Every novella became. I've, I've a heard mutual, about a that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 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 ironically, uh, a couple of these uh, books that I'm with the Father's Day and the Christmas, uh, I have interest from Hollywood and in t- in turning into into films. Amazing. So, uh, I think that's the future. I'm, and and then I will my songwriting will sort of pack around that. Uh, you know what I would love to see is if some of these some of these things become films that I can go in and, and maybe help write the songs and oh, you know that kind of thing. But I, I'm more kind of thirty thousand feet focused, you know, from the big big project thing now, as opposed to just shotgunning songs all day long, right. which is really hard for, to do and and uh, you need a lot of time to be able to do that. And I don't have as much time as I yeah. used to have got a daughter and a son and a, you know and everything. So it's great. But all your skill sets are evolving and they're turning into other creative. Passions, yeah, absolutely. Which is really, really cool. Which yeah. is kind of where I am in my life too, because I'm yeah. staring at the same age, you know. Yeah. And thinking, you know, uh, doing a mental inventory. How do I want? To, how do I want to spend my next twenty years? Yeah, that's right. Know? So. Uh, very yeah, cool. when you when you see it, you know, I'm fifty, and so I look at it and go, I don't, I probably don't have as much in front of me as I've got behind me. I don't. That doesn't bother me. Yeah. Like I'm not really. I'm not a fearer of death. I don't have that thing. But what I do want to do is make sure I get the stories told that I have inside me and, and, and whatever it is and I would encourage everybody this whatever it is you have burning you up you have to get it out we need it right we need it well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just more convinced than ever that it's bigger it's it's more important we just need it like I once again the comedians and cars things because I've literally been binging it like the last two days <laughs> but I think to myself what if one of these guys or girls decided, nah, you know what, I, I can't do the comedian thing. I'm just going to go work in an office 
and, but they have the natural gift. And think of what we would lose. Mm-hmm. No Seinfeld. Just, you know what I mean? Think of what we would lose if Jerry Seinfeld went, you know what? That's just too hard. I'm going to go to college like my parents want me to do, and, and I'm going to be a doctor. Oh, my gosh. Think of what we would have lost. Mm-hmm. You know? And so... Be a funny doctor. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> what is the deal with the pancreas? You know, and so. But, What's the deal? <clears throat> so I just, I, I just want to tell you guys and you guys, everybody out there, do it, do it. We need it. We need you. We there's need actually, what you have to say. There's actually a great video by Vaynerchuk called uh, Six Minutes for the Next Sixty Years of Your Life." Look it up. Google it. It's on YouTube. It's a six-minute video, and he talks about that. He says, you know, if you think that you're done at forty or fifty years old. This little device in your pocket is tells you the contrary. I mean, That's it's, you can do it. You, you, can you always it. wanted to bread, you know, build bread baskets. Yeah. Go do it. That's right. Put it out there. Absolutely. You can, and you can reinvent yourself, you know, which is yeah. which is very multi potential, right? Yeah. yeah. So cool. Yeah. So so cool. Any any last poignant questions or you mentioned Vegas. You know, it's it's a little bit of it's just a little taboo for me because I I mean I've talked mentioned it twice in two. Matter, matter of fact, the last motivational speech I did for TriStar Healthcare, yeah, the surgeon that was the head of the hospital that treated two hundred of the victims, really, spoke right before me, really, and then I spoke after, and we gave two different perspectives, but it was the same perspective. Yeah. Um, we're moving on, man. You know, we we're the Ghost Town Troubadours were the. First music event at Mandalay Bay after that. Event. How soon after was it? Five days. Five days. We were on Friday. You guys were Sunday. Yep. And we were on Friday. Night. And Friday we were in New York getting ready to do SNL. Were you, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You sure were. Yeah. So we, we, and we so we talked about you and we talked about you know Danny. Danny wrote she's country. Yeah. So we talked about Jason and um, man, what an experience, dude. Yeah. And, and God bless you. Yeah. God bless you, man. God bless you, brother. <laughs> And I, you know, that, that we went and saw the memorial and we saw, you know, we went and saw the venue and, and, and it was just, it was horrific. I can't imagine living through that. So there was a, uh, there was a feeling in Vegas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, Vegas is so crass, but I got to tell you, it was really warm that night. I mean, you could tell people were really coming together and they, they don't want to see that. I lived you know? in Vegas for four years and it has that perception, but that's a community that comes together. They they are. Yeah, they really they, do. They really they have a, an underlying warmth to them that's that's pretty astounding. The locals. The locals. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, I worked for a six six group radio station out six station radio group out there, CBS radio back in 01 after nine eleven, and we had one of the biggest nine eleven um, tribute events in the country. Yeah. Yeah, you know, biggest turnout event. I mean, and you know, and, and what you also might not believe, but a lot of patriots in Vegas, a lot of real American patriots that love playing out there, and we play a lot. We used to play a lot of the local hangs. Uh, Mandalay Bay is sort of the first sort of tourist place we play, but we used to play like Green Valley Ranch and, you yeah. know, yeah. Sta- uh, Sunset Station and places like that. And we just love the locals, man. We have great friends out yeah, there. Yeah, I always ask so. where. Yeah. Ask the locals, where do I go for sushi, go? coffee, Absolutely. entertainment? You yeah. know, <laughs> because I don't really want to pay forty dollars for a pot of coffee right. at the MGM. But you know, we we find ourselves in Vegas at least twice a year in the last fifteen years because you got the ACMs, you got the rodeos, yeah. you got the, you know, it's just a staple in the country music yeah, diet. Absolutely, you know, the, the sideman diet. Yeah. Um, well, this was so so awesome. I really and enjoyed I, it, and I'm sure that everybody listening out there and watching really got a lot of information from this. Good. And how can everybody find you? Right now, uh, Reggie Ham blog, Reggie Ham blog on WordPress. Reggie Ham blog. It's dot, dot com. com. Yeah, okay. it's one G two M's. Love it. It's exactly <laughs> the opposite of what it's supposed to be, folks. Love it. So one G two M's. Reggie Ham uh, blog dot com. I gotta check that out. Yeah, and you'll have my blog, and it'll link you to my Facebook. And I do a lot of work on Facebook. I do a Facebook live every Wednesday. You're night. a tweeter. You're I'm, a- I'm a tweeter. I'm a I'm a fa- I'm a poster. I'm a blogger. Well, you're kind of you a know, thought leader, and you have a, a wonderful sense of humor. And you. you know, you're a, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to take any of it too seriously. I mean, at the end of the day, man, there are some serious things that we need to talk about. But you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of people need they need music, they need laughter, they need to feel like it's going to be okay, and it is going to be okay. You know, it is. Even if it's not, it still is in a way. You know, and yeah. uh, I think that's one of the wonderful things you get out of music is. You, when you when there's a song that moves you, there's something inherent in that song that tells you, man, life's gonna be okay, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I I remember just when I was growing up, and I would hear 
Goodbye Yellow Brick Road or, you know, in the 70s, you know, the, all the great 70s songs. I hear a Carol King record or something, and it just always made me feel like, or Andre Crouch, you know, or some, some great gospel song. And it always made me feel like, oh, man, that's okay. It's all right, you right. know. That's what we're here to do, you know. So big time. You yeah. know, what makes me happy listening to old Rod Stewart. From oh the yeah, 70s dude. And the faces and yeah. all the the bands from the seventies. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I was born in July of seventy, and I, so I guess people would say, "Well, you're an eighties baby," because when you were a teenager, you were listening to eighties. Yeah, music. but it was in the air in the seventies, man. You, you, you it was got so it. special. It was a special. And time. We didn't have the Disney Channel, so we got to listen to rock and roll, right? Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> you know, really, it was really crazy. I mean, my kids growing up, their first ten years of their life, it was all Disney songs. But and I, I realized this the other day. I was like, we didn't have this when I was growing up. We had to listen to AM radio. You know, I mean, my Disney Channel was was Charlie Rich and you know, Mac Davis and you know all that stuff. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Got to thank you Good, so man. much thank you for, for having uh, me. Absolutely. sharing your wisdom today, and it was uh, so, we are so overdue for sitting down and doing this. Yeah, and, absolutely. And uh, hopefully, we can do some creative stuff together. That'd be great. I'm going to check out your book and your blog. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Reggie Ham, everyone. Also, a big hand for Jim McCarthy. Yes, sir. Jim McCarthy Voiceovers. Right. Yes. Go to richredmond.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Comment. Rate. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Check yeah. yeah, check us out on all the socials. I'm a sitting duck on the Google Nader, just richredmond.com or just type in Rich Redmond. And check out drumminginthemodernworld.com. It's 120 uh, videos shot in HD, drum education videos. We're trying to sell these things. It's a yeah, tough, a tough call these days. You know why? Because everybody can get everything for free on YouTube. But hey, go check me out on YouTube. I got 400 videos on there to benefit you and your drumming and your music career. But I do want to thank you guys for checking out Pick Rich's Brain, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And check us out on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, richredman.com, and check us out at on unfilteredradio.com. And that's P-H-I-L, it's my friend Phil. I'm on Saturday nights on unfilteredradio.com. Thanks a lot, I'll see you next time.